Welcome to the Bad Roman Podcast. On this show, we talk with veterans, community leaders, Christians, and non-Christians as we explore the entanglement of Christians with the state. The Bad Roman Project was created out of the firm belief that as Christians, we are called to follow Christ, not the state. Here is your host, Craig Hargis. Hey, folks. Today, we're going to continue the series of having other podcasters on the show. Derek Creator of the Fourth Way Podcast joins me to tell us about the Fourth Way, and we're going to talk about propaganda, which is always a fun conversation for me and a lot of people who listen to this show. Before we get into the conversation, I would like to give a shout out to a, a new listener. His name is Josh, who sent us a very generous donation to the project, which is so helpful because one thing that that was so surprising to me was the time, the effort, and now the cost that goes into producing a you know a decent podcast that people will come back and listen to. So when, when somebody sends us a little bit of money or even just shares the show, it, it means so much to us. So I just want to give a shout out to Josh and thank him very much for that very generous donation. Derek, how are you doing, my friend? Doing very well. I'm tired because uh, it's midnight here, but you know, with the, with this whole project of getting to talk to people all around the world, it's so surprising to me the time difference. Like, I just it's it's so crazy. Like, we have friends in Australia now that are you know that help with the project, and it's summertime there, and I'm freezing here in Memphis, Tennessee. So, so it's just strange. And right now, you know, it's it's. Four a little after four o'clock in the afternoon in Memphis, it's probably eight or nine o'clock in the morning there. So it's and it's midnight where you're at right now. Yeah. So I, I appreciate you guys staying up late to have this conversation. You had me on your show uh, here a while back, and that that was a cool conversation. You were very uh, patient with me because that day I was not <laughs> feeling well at all. I was I was struggling through that. I listened to I, I listened to that episode again after you published it, and I was like, man. I remember how I felt that day because I could hear it. I could hear my sniffles. You know, I got allergies anyway, but some days are worse than others. That day I was legit sick, and I, I appreciate you being patient with me that 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 day when we recorded. Yeah, as long as you return the favor and are patient with me today, we'll be good. <laughs> I'll do my best. I mean, I'm usually pretty patient with the guests. I like it when they uh, just lead the conversation. And I just kind of sit back and uh, learn a few things, but. Before we get started, if anybody's not familiar with The Fourth Way or Derek Creter, why don't you uh, give us a little bit of background of yourself, and then, then we'll start talking about the project and how you got started and what made you want to do this crazy thing of doing a podcast. So tell us a little bit about Derek. Yeah, so um, I mean, I, I grew up like a lot of uh, other Christians in my circle in, in just a, a pretty conservative Christian environment. Went to a Christian school growing up, went to a Christian college, taught at a Christian school in Mexico City, came back, taught in a Christian school, and then taught in public school for a couple of years. So I was, you know, really inundated with conservative Christianity. Um, and uh, that led me eventually, so right now I'm on the mission field in Romania. So we're, uh, we're over here. We came here because uh, I actually like apologetics and discussion and those those sorts of things. So one of our hopes was that when we when we came over to Romania, we'd eventually get to be able to talk to college students about uh, you know different reasons for for our faith and uh, for the feasibility of Christianity and stuff. Because as you know, Europe is kind of uh, on the trends towards atheism. They a lot of countries have kind of uh, committed to that, and then uh, Romania is kind of behind the rest in in their leaving of Christianity, but. Nevertheless, there are a lot of people seeking and, and asking questions here. That's interesting. What b- before we get into the fourth one, I, I got a question about that. What do you think is driving that? That if they're if they're what's heading toward what's what is getting them to head towards atheism? I mean, I don't think I'm familiar with that. I mean, what what do you think is causing that? Or do you have have you ever been able to pinpoint it? Yeah. So, uh, in my opinion, I think that that sacralism uh, has a lot to do with it. So, which is just the basically the institutionalization of religion, which, which makes it dead. Uh, so for example, um, we had an exchange student when, uh, when after my wife and I got married, uh, we were young, we were in, in our young twenties and we had this like 16 year old exchange student from Spain, but 
he comes over and he's, you know, he doesn't believe in God, but he's a Christian. He's a Catholic. Uh, here in Romania, I was on a plane uh, with somebody and we started talking about, you know, what I do here in religion. And he's like, yeah, I'm an Orthodox Christian. I'm like, cool. And then a, a few minutes later, he says that he's an atheist. And I'm like, <laughs> what, what do you mean you're an atheist? You just said you're a Christian. He's like, well, yeah, I was, I was born into... Like I was born in Romania to Orthodox parents and they baptized me in the Orthodox church. So therefore I'm Orthodox, but intellectually he's an atheist. And I was like, okay, I, I think I can kind of understand that you were baptized into the church and you can't help that it was done to you. So you consider yourself part of the church. Great. But when you have kids, because you don't adhere to that, like you're not going to baptize them, right? And force that on them. He's like, well, no, I'm Orthodox. Of course I'm going to baptize him. <laughs> So, so there's the, just this American individualism, this mindset is, and, and Romania is not even all that different from the United States compared to, you know, certain other cultures, but like some of those things just don't make sense to us. Huh. What I've noticed a lot in, in just with this project and in, in America itself is a lot of people are leaving the church here, but they're not heading towards atheism. They're still consider themselves Christian. But they're looking for something different because like you just talked about, you know, the church being institutionalized. And that's something we talk about all the time with this project that, and people are stepping back from it because it doesn't look like if you take the, the teachings of Christ very seriously, it doesn't look like Christ when what, what you're seeing in churches and people are stepping back and they're starting their own home churches or they're just having small groups and stuff. And then you get other folks being like, well, you need to be in church. I'm like, but, why can't I have church with me and Derek here just having a, a conversation on a podcast? We're talking about Jesus. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be also. You know, so why does it have to be in a building somewhere? Why can't you, you know what I'm saying? So I see a lot of people kind of pushing back against you know what we would see as church, and I get it. I've done it myself. I'm, I, I totally understand where they're coming from, and I have a lot of friends who listen to this who encourage me to find a church. But I tell you what, man, it is difficult in this area to find a church that I would feel comfortable in because I could walk out my front door, probably throw a rock and hit a Southern Baptist church. I spent a lot of time in those churches and this is nothing against my Southern Baptist friends. I love them dearly. I've just seen too much that I can't participate in it because it would, I wouldn't get anything out of it. I'd be sitting there judging the people the entire time. And that's not what I want to do. I want to be there to worship. I wanted to be there to learn and we're getting off topic, but I, I like this conversation. I don't get I don't get to talk about it very often, but I, I but I understand the pushback. Now, what you were talking about that guy there with the being baptized in it and being an atheist, that's a little confusing to me, but it is what it is. Yeah, and you I mean you you probably don't follow Southern Baptist news and stuff, but I don't know if you heard all the stuff that's going on in the Southern Baptist Church in regard to abuse, which is uh, you know, what what we're kinda gonna be talking a little bit about today, but uh, the, just the cover-ups and and the extent to which abuse has happened within the church by leadership and the cover-ups by it is is just astounding. Wow. No, I, you're right. I don't follow it. So uh, when we get done uh, talking about the fourth wave, maybe we'll start there and we'll get into propaganda. I'm sure you, that'll probably be part of the propaganda conversation as well. So yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar, but I'm now I'm super curious. So let's talk about that as well. Um Tell me about the fourth way. First of all, what made you want to start a, a podcast? I mean, I know why I had my own reasons and everybody's got their own reasons for doing it. It seems like everybody and their mom has a podcast these days, you know, and I, and I love it. I think we need to get, and I've said this from the very jump. I wish we had more podcasts. We need to flood the arena with podcasts because people need to be heard and people are going to have perspectives that somebody's going to be, is going to resonate with that might not res resonate with Derek or resonate with Craig, but they're going to hear something from a different podcast and they're going to latch onto it. They're going to hear something that they're not hearing in their churches or hearing at school or from their parents. You know what I'm saying? So what made you want to start the fourth way? Well, I, you know, I don't want to beat a dead horse because everybody that almost a lot of people that I talk to in this community, uh, it's 2016, right? right. President Trump, uh, that, that whole election thing. And that's pretty much that's pretty much what it was for me. You know, being steeped in conservative Christianity for most of my life, uh, I remember you know a story I tell is in my Christian school. There's this stupid Garfield poster up on my like seventh grade science classroom wall, and it says, uh, "Integrity is doing the right thing even when nobody's watching or when nobody's looking." And so we get to 2016, and I'm like, 
you know what integrity would look like? It would look like uh, not being a consequentialist, not saying that the ends justify the means. So then what did our community do? But they just went all in on uh, President Trump and just justifying his actions and all that kind of stuff. And I was just, my, my mind was blown. Like my, my heart was just ripped out that my community who taught me about integrity had none. And so that really, really got me thinking. And at the same time, I had a friend who sent me some video uh, debate about pacifism. I was like, oh, this is the dumbest thing ever. <laughs> um, I respected this guy and I was like, okay, I'm going to do my due diligence. I'm going to watch this one video and then I'm going to say it's the dumbest thing I've ever seen and get rid of it. Uh, but the video is amazing and hands down the, the pacifist argument won. And I was like, okay, right. They got lucky. You know, they had some bad people that they were debating. But as I started to, to look through the arguments for pacifism, the early church, all that stuff, I was like, this, this actually makes sense. And it kind of clicked for me because, you know, the reason people aren't pacifists is because, well, it doesn't work, right? It doesn't, uh, it doesn't seem like it's reasonable that, that uh, it's going to produce the results that you want. It's not comfortable. I was like, this is exactly the reason that we're voting for somebody in Trump and we can't bite a bullet. Like we have to, we have to seek power and grasp at power. And so that was kind of the realization to me that the common theme that I think you see with a lot of moral compromise, uh, especially in the political realm is, and, and the Christian realm is this ends justifying the means, this consequential moral ethic that we have. And so I was like, I need to really think through this. And so I knew to think through it, I would need to write or record or something. So I started a podcast as a blog for myself. You know, there, there aren't very many people who listen to, uh, to my podcast and I'm okay with that. Like, sure. I would love lots of people to listen to it, but I go back to my podcast all the time to refresh my memory on, you know, certain arguments and, and stuff. So I did it personally to, to kind of explore my whole Christian upbringing and, and Christian argumentation. Yeah, not to beat a dead horse, but everybody that listens to the Bad Roman knows that you. It sounds like you and I started on the same path. And, you know, I didn't start it so I could go back and listen to myself. Actually, when I listen to our podcast, I cringe every time I hear myself coming across my radio. So, I, because I, I'm sitting there nitpick myself constantly, you know. Well, hopefully that didn't, didn't sound arrogant. I didn't mean I, I I record myself to go back. No, 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 no. I I get it. I get it. No, I I mean. I can sit and listen to you. But I'm talking about myself. Like I don't, I don't like hearing myself on there because I don't, I don't really have a way of w with words all the time, and I can hear myself stammering. And thankfully for our producer, she can cut out a lot of the nonsense that comes out of my mouth. And thank God for her, obviously. But let's start with this news you just were talking about. With well, hang on before we get there about the fourth way. So. Tell me about the name. Like I asked you this maybe after we start, we, we got that recording when you had me on. I remember asking you this and tell me about the name, the fourth way, because I think people might be curious about where you came up with that. Yeah. So I was, I was part of a, a group online um, and that was, that was involved with uh, Christian pacifism. And so I was talking to them about starting a podcast and, and asking for name recommendations. And there's a, there's a famous article by Walter Wink called the third way, um, you know, where, you know, fight or flight, right? So you get, get those two poles. And then the third way is, you know, there's always some other option. So go back to the 2016 election, right? Well, it's either Trump or Clinton. It's like, well, no, it's not. You know, there are lots of other candidates that you could vote for. You could write ones in, but you could also not vote, right? There, there's always a third way. There's an option that uh, doesn't involve moral compromise. And so I, I liked that. Um, but then somebody said, well, yeah, but there, there are actually four ways, right? There's fight, flight, or freeze, right? You can do nothing, which is what a lot of people think that pacifism is, right? Passiveism as opposed to, opposed to pacifism. And so they said it would be great to distinguish pacifism from passivism. Uh, so how about a fourth way? Kind of put a, a different spin on it. You know, every time I mention my, uh, myself being a pacifist now, even when I hear myself say it, it sounds strange to me. And I've become one, you know, through the course of this project. But even to this day, saying that I'm a pacifist, it's still for some reason, 
And I don't know if it goes back from growing up in West Texas or what it what it was, but the pacifist idea, I think pacifism looks different to a lot of different folks. Where I land on it is I'm not willing to ever take another person's life. Okay. That doesn't mean that I wouldn't try to restrain somebody if they were harming somebody in any fashion. You know what I mean? So I've just, I've recently taken up jujitsu and that's one thing that attracted me to jujitsu was it seemed like a very, I wouldn't call it peaceful because it's a, it's a, it's a fight. It's a struggle, but you're, 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 you're able to, you're learning how to restrain somebody or defend yourself without killing them. You know, a lot of with what the way I understood self-defense, you picked up a pistol and that's self-defense. It doesn't have to be that way. And so I, even where I, where I'm at with it now is, I'm not willing to take somebody else's life, even if it means me losing my life. If that gives somebody the opportunity to, to get away, you know? to me that is that is working towards. But that, the way pacifism was described to me by Abby Kleckner and by uh, Bruxy KV, you know, where you're actively working towards peace. And once it was explained to me that way, I was like, okay, that makes sense. So if you're saving somebody else's life, and you see these these uh, examples of folks on death row who are pardoned by the victim's families, they, they were not pushing for the death penalty and it changed these folks' lives. They're never getting out of prison, but they found God or they found Jesus in some fashion because this family chose not to kill them in return. And, you know, and it's just a, you're working towards peace, you know, and, the, and that person can tell that story to somebody else. You know, that's what we're doing may seem so small in that moment or maybe seem huge or whatever, but, we don't know what God's going to do with it later, you know, so I, so I don't worry about it. I just live my life. And if it comes up, it comes up. I mean, I don't know, but hopefully I don't ever have to deal with it. Yeah, I I mean, I, I completely understand emotionally. I still I struggle with pacifism and I, I couldn't tell you that I wouldn't harm somebody if there's a gun around and somebody who's coming to hurt my kids or somebody else's kids. I can't tell you what I would do, but. I think one of the things that pacifism does and, and reading some of the stories of pacifists and how they've implemented, uh, you know, that ethic, there's, there's a whole lot more creativity than, you know, either you shoot him or you just let the guy do whatever he wants. There, there's a whole lot more that usually often can be done. Um, so I, I, I enjoy the creativity of, of pacifism and, and, uh, thinking, beyond the poles, but also just bringing the humanity back into the offender. Because, you know, we act like, well, that this guy who's murdering somebody else uh, is is so terrible because he's objectifying somebody unto death when, you know, your willingness to kill him says that, well, I'm I'm objectifying him unto death too. Right. Yeah. And I could sit here and, and spout all this stuff off about what what I would do. I'd I don't think that's honest though, because I don't think we'd all really do know what we do in that moment. You know, like I said, I hope I'm never in that situation. I mean, we can hope and pray, but you know, you never know. And just hopefully that I'm hoping that if something does arise, that I choose the right, <laughs> I make the right decision in that instance, you know, cause it's probably going to be a split second thing. And who knows? Um, one thing about pacifism too, and you mentioned the early church while ago that my study and readings of the early church writings has, has really screwed me up. And I think it's in a good way. I'm not, when I say screwed me up, I don't think it screwed me up in the head. I think it just, it, it really changed my direction on, on how, how I looked at pacifism as well, because that was universal among the early church, you know, and I always say prior to Constantine, you can, you can't find anything in their writings that suggests otherwise. I have not, I have not. I mean, I don't know if you've seen anything, but I have not seen anything to suggest otherwise that they would do any harm to anybody else. No, I haven't. In any instance. And I say, I, you know, they they were much closer to the situation than we are. So maybe they had it going on. They had it figured out. And somewhere along the way, we've, we've got it twisted. Yeah. Hey, folks, Craig here. And I'd like to let y'all know we are always looking for writers to contribute to our blog. I don't care if you have any experience or not. Two or three of our contributors had no prior experience writing, and it turns out they have a real knack for it. Our project coordinator helps them put the articles together, and she publishes them on our website and Facebook page, and you will also have the option to come on the show and go more in-depth about your article. So if you like what we're doing at The Bad Roman and would like to try your hand at writing, then send us an email at thebadromanpodcast at gmail.com. 
We're having a blast with this project, and we would love for you to join us in helping promote it. Now back to the show. All right. I took some notes down about your series on uh, propaganda, but what you mentioned a while ago about the Southern Baptists and, and stuff, why don't we start there? Why don't you just fill me in and maybe fill in the listeners on, on this if, if they're not familiar with it? Because I'm, I'm completely ignorant to the uh, story. So I don't, I mean, I don't know a ton about it. I didn't spend a lot of time researching this, this specific avenue, but uh, my wife grew up in the Southern Baptist Church. We have friends in the Southern Baptist Church. And I, um, you know, I, I follow it a little bit, especially uh, some of the ethical things coming out of more conservative Christianity. And the Southern Baptists have just, um, they, they it's come out that they've had quite a lot of leaders who uh, have abused other people and then some very prominent leaders who have have covered up abuse and and asked people to be silent about it, both in the Southern Baptist Convention as well as some of the institutions of of higher learning there. Uh, you have uh, there was somebody I don't know if you're familiar with Rachel Den Hollander, but she's got a a fantastic book. Uh, what is a girl worth? I believe it's called. And she was she was famous at Michigan, Michigan State. I think it was Michigan. Uh, there was this guy named Larry Nasser, who was uh, the he was seeing a lot of gymnasts and other girls uh, for for medical treatments, and he was abusing them. And I think Simone Biles was was one of uh, his victims as well. So she came forward, and uh, in her book she talks about just how how terrible the church was at at supporting that. Um, she talks a little bit about that. Um, but, but just her kind of journey through abuse and identifying it and how it got covered up. But then she became an advocate in the church because she's a Christian and she had, she had spoken, I believe to the Southern Baptists and other people about, Hey, let's, let's get your act together. And they, they pushed back against her, you know, at at this, at this time in the, with the Me Too movement and everything, they kind of had to show this face of, Oh yeah, we care. You know, we want to do stuff, uh, to help. But then you get these recordings of them that come out where they're saying, hey, look, this is this is going to offend people. Like we need to play to the base. Like they literally said that, like we need to play to the base, right? Because that's where your funding and everything comes from. And it's just it's just an absolute mess. And I, I wouldn't say that it's it's specific to the Southern Baptist Church, right? We've seen it in the Catholic Church. I know that we, we have people come into our church who uh, are meant to help train uh, train people who work with kids as well as help to prevent liability and stuff. And they're like, look, every, every year, every year, like six out of the last eight years, six out of the last seven years to like abuse, right? Sexual, sexual allegations have been the, the number one issue for churches in conservative Christianity. Uh, so it's, it's all over the place. It's just, we're seeing it now in the Southern Baptist convention, but it's everywhere. What do you think that's, See that's and that's why people are, why when people get confused why people are <laughs> leaving the church, how can you be confused about it? You see this happening, or you hear about this happening. There's got to be and this. This explains a lot of why people are leaving. It. I mean, it doesn't look like Jesus. That doesn't sound anything like Jesus. But what what do you think is driving? Is it power? I mean, because to me, I think that it, in my opinion, it has to come from if you're giving these folks power in the church, authority in the church. Then they can take it too far. We saw it with Bruxy Cavey, okay. And I've had him on the show a couple of times, and we got some pushback from, you know, some people wanting us to take his episodes down. And and I haven't spoken publicly about it much. I've, I've talked about it privately, but I'll but I'll talk about it right here. I'm not taking his episodes down, okay. He made a mistake more than once, okay. So I'm, but I'm not. I'm, and if that, if that costs me the listeners of this show, I'm, I can't do anything about that. But I'm not taking this episode down because the conversations were great. There's still things to be learned in those conversations, in my opinion. Okay, that is not me condoning Bruxy Cavey. But what we saw with that situation, he was in a position of authority. And it seemed like he took advantage of that position. And so I'm wondering if that's what's going on with these churches. If you've got folks in positions of authority... When they probably shouldn't have this authority. I mean, you know, the whole the whole mission of Christ, ministry of Christ, was to serve, to teach us to serve one another, not to lord over one another. And you know, he, he said that over. He said that 
you see how the Gentiles lord over one another, it will not be so among you. And so do you think it do you think it has something to do with the authority that's given to these folks, these these flawed human beings, first of all, were flawed, giving them this power over other people in the church and they take it to a different level. And they can't help themselves, or maybe they saw they they looked or they seeked out that uh, that position of authority so they could have that authority over folks and, and take advantage of people. I mean, it could be any of it, really. But w- what do you think is causing that? Yeah, so I I mean I think so I think there are a couple different levels. So let's say uh, the individual responsible for sexual assault. Um, I think I think a lot of times people. We, we have a problematic view of, of uh, people who, who commit crimes. First of all, we think that they're other than us, right? They're, they're uh, uniquely different. Like, they're not like me. And we think that they must be some devious person who, who tries to get into power and tries to manipulate other people and tries to, to do bad things. Sometimes that's, that's the case. But a lot of times, I think it is, it is power. It's power that ends up causing somebody to do those things. So you get power, you find yourself in a position of authority and you start to take advantage of that and you like the taste of it and, and you just get on a power trip. But I I think that with the Southern Baptist convention, I think you see a different type of thing too. So you, you do have the abusers who um, maybe are more uh, power hungry and, and people who, who are, are manipulative, but then you've got the leadership who covers it up. It's like, well, if you're not an abuser, why would why would you cover it up? Well, it's because you like your power too. Uh, if if I'm part of the Southern Baptist Convention and they're the biggest conservative Christian denomination in the United States, uh, if I think that if abuse comes out, we're going to lose funding, I'm going to lose control, then yeah, I'm going to cover it up. And, and how am I going to do it? I'm going to say, I'm doing this for Jesus, right? Because we don't want to tarnish his reputation. He wouldn't want this to get out because it would make Jesus look bad. And then think of all the people who would go to hell if uh, if they thought that the church was full of abusers. So let's just brush this under the rug for Jesus. And and that's that's exactly what we see. You know, again, consequentialism in my mind, which is why I did my second season was on consequentialism because the reason I wasn't a pacifist, the reason I wasn't generous with my money. The reason I would have voted for Trump, you know, a year or two prior is because the ends justify the means. So a lot of the cover-ups come from this this ethic that we say that we don't have, right? Christians say we believe in objective morality, and then they end up being consequentialists. So do you think there's any way back? I mean, to get away from that, do you do we need to tear down these institutions and start over? I mean, or or, or is it just going to keep growing and festering the way it is? If we keep sweep, but the thing about sweeping something under the rug, <laughs> you can only do that for so long until you got this giant lump under the rug and it's going to get noticed and then it's going to come out. You can only hide saying things for so long, especially in an organization as big as the Southern Baptist Convention. You're not going to be able to hide. I mean, what is that? What is that? What do they say about a conspiracy that you can't get everybody it's not a conspiracy because you'd have to com- keep so many people quiet. And, and I, I know I'm paraphrasing that and, and murdering that that statement, but you, do you, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, that's that's something that I've started to realize. Like I used to believe that too. You know, if you need to keep enough people quiet, it's not going to work. But after studying conspiracies for for the last year, there there's some pretty big conspiracies with lots of people that we know for sure have happened. And there are other there are other factors involved with that. But don't you think at some point it's going to be exposed, though? I mean, like, what I'm, I guess what I'm getting at is if they continue to sweep this under the rug and hide it, eventually it's going to get exposed. And it sounds like it's been exposed if, if we're talking about it right here on this podcast. I mean, I didn't know anything about it, but you knew about it. And now more people that didn't know about it are listening to this. They're going to know about it. So it's been exposed. And I'm not saying we have this huge reach but enough people listen to the show are going to that may have not heard of this and i know i've got southern baptist folks that listen to this i wonder if they know about it i'm tempted to call them right now (laughs) and see if they know anything about it but yeah i mean it's it's definitely been exposed like this isn't this isn't conspiracy theory types of things like we know that this stuff has happened um it's uh yeah it's it's very difficult to deal with i i don't know 
exactly what, what the answer is. You know, you talked about just tearing down the whole establishment, but you know, if you tear it down and start all over, the same thing is going to end up happening. Cause I think people do what people do. And I, I think it's kind of, I think it's a problem to view this as a uniquely church thing. Right? It's not that the church is so inherently corrupt. It's that people are corrupt. And whenever you institutionalize something, it's, it's going to be corrupted. You can say the same thing about the state. I mean, it's, I keep calling myself a collapsitarian and, you know, just, you know, just, just let it fall. We'll figure it, figure it out afterwards. And people will say, well, somebody's just going to rebuild the same thing we've already got, just like you mentioned. And maybe, but my whole point is, is I don't really care if it falls. Like if, if the, if the institution that we see as the church today, which is not what Jesus had intended, if it falls, I'm, I can't sit here and say that I'm going to shed a tear over it. If the state falls tomorrow, I can't sit here. I'm, everybody knows I'm not going to shed a tear about that. I would be sad about how the church is gone because it should be, it should not, it should, to me, it resembles the state today. It resembles what the state looks like. And I think that's probably the biggest problem, you know, with the entanglement with the Christian, with the state, with the churches in the state. And, I, and that's why they look so much alike. And, and that's maybe that's why people are push, pulling back. They're like, we wanted something different. And the church is not offering us anything different. We're getting the same thing in the church that we could go get in government. Or with the state, you know, so maybe that's why people are, are pulling back from it. I don't know. I think that's why I did. Now that I think about it, because a lot of the, what I saw in church looked too much like politics. It looked too much like the government. It looked too much like the state. So I'll pull back from it because I don't recognize the church like I thought the church would be, you know, and I used to be a part of that system, a part of that institution. Because, and I believed what we were doing was the right thing. It was the same thing with politics, the same thing with the church. And now that I know what I know. I can't be involved with it knowing what I've learned along the way with this project, with, with the early church and just the very basic teachings of Christ. I can't be involved with that stuff in my own mind. This is not me saying, Derek, you've got to do it the way Craig's doing it or anybody listens, listening to this has got to do it the way Craig is doing it. This is me saying, this is Craig. This is where Craig's at with it because I can't, I myself in my own, with my own self-conscious, I cannot participate. Now, that being said, I would love to participate in a local church. I would love to fill that community, you know, of uh, uh, believers that are seeking first the kingdom of God. I just don't know if it exists. And if it exists, it, it exists on a very small scale. And it's so difficult to find. I think what, uh, one of the issues is that, so if you point this out to your, your Southern Baptist friends, uh, depending on if they're... They're like, oh yeah, I, you know, this is the type of thing that happens. Or, or if they're really defensive, if you're defensive, you're going to say, well, those are a bunch of, you know, those 500 cases, however many there are, those are all individual examples of individuals, individuals. So they'd individualize the problem to dismiss it as it's not a church problem; it's an individual problem. Uh, and what what I think you're you're saying is that this seems more systemic than an individual problem. It seems to be a, a corporate problem uh, of, of structure. And so that's, that's a big thing that you need to, to identify. Is this individual or is it being fostered by the structure? I think it is. I think it's a system. It's turned into a system. And I think that's why people are pulling back from it. I think. I know that's why I did. I've never really, I don't think I've really thought about it that hard until just now, but I think that's exactly why I pulled back from it because it looked too much what, like what I was seeing with, with government and with the state. And I, it's, it doesn't resemble what I saw with the early writings with, with what we saw in the Bible. It doesn't, you don't, it doesn't resemble that anymore. So why should I, why would I participate in that? Yeah. And, and the, the big issue is that you've got pastors who are celebrities at this point as opposed to shepherds, right? That's what a pastor is. It's it's somebody who lays down his life for the sheep. And Christianity has always been an inverted pyramid. It's been an upside down kingdom model. And what I think you see in in our churches is it's it's a power and control model uh, with a with a hierarchy top down, and that's that's going to lead to a lot of people abusing power who shouldn't be in there. And sure, that's their individual problem. But then what happens when you get into the system? And the system who might not, they might not be abusers themselves, but starts to cover it up because they're a top-down model and they can't lose their base. 
And that's where the money comes in, you know, comes in. They don't want to lose the funding. You mentioned that a while ago. And when you said that, I was like, well, there it is right there. I mean, it's the funding. It's the funding. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's the same. And we're going to get into propaganda now. Let's talk about propaganda because it's what it, when you see politicians, and I'm going to use them as an, as an example. We just use the church as an, as an example when it comes to funding. But what about politicians? They're going to go wherever the wind blows, wherever the funding is coming, right? And there's going to be, that's where their bias is going to be, which that's where their propaganda is going to lie. And it's, it's in the, with the entire state, it's within the entire government. It's, it's all through it to, to tell me that any of them are any different from one another at this point. I'm going to call you, I'm going to call you either willfully ignorant or because you can't, ignorance is just not knowing. Like, I don't, ignorance is not a bad word, but to me, willful ignorance is one of the worst things you can be because it's right there in front of your face. But you're so dug in to this prop, you bought into this side's propaganda that you, that you're so, and then you're so against this side. And now you're, everybody's divided. And I think it's intentional. Propaganda is, is has, it, to me, is 100% intentional. Yeah, I think it's 100% intentional, but I think sometimes there's this misconception that uh, it, it's 100% intentional by somebody who's seeking to manipulate you for nefarious reasons, when a lot of times propaganda is is something that's done by people who are sincere, right? Uh, so the example that I give is if you if you call, you know, if you you call some company and you get some automated teller, right? Uh, and you just start pushing a bunch of buttons. Your experience isn't that good. But when you get a human person, uh, it generally your experience is, is much better. You feel heard. You feel uh, like you got somewhere in that conversation. It's much less frustrating. Well, you think about propaganda. Uh, if you have somebody who you can tell is disingenuous, you uh, you can tell is just some jerk who's who's on some power trip and he doesn't really care about you, Maybe you believe some of the things that he says and you just say, oh, he's a corrupt politician, but yeah, I like this policy. But if you believe that the person is genuinely sincere and and they believe what they say, you're going to buy into that propaganda a whole lot more. So I think it's, it's important to recognize that, uh, yeah, people try to use propaganda, but that doesn't mean that they're – they're not sincere in what they're trying to propagandize you about. <laughs> well, and, and maybe, maybe this will help too, because you have to understand that propaganda, like everybody propagandizes. I propagandize my kids, right? Depending on how you define the word propaganda, propaganda is education. We've just started, we've started to slap that word only on the, the information that people are trying to instill in others that we don't like. I, I think propaganda has become a propagandized word because when you use it, uh, you can use it to define what other people do and say that you don't do the same thing when you are. Okay. Yeah, I think maybe the word is is misused some then because my understanding of it is that you got one one side saying this and they're manipulating this group of people to keep them on their side so they can keep their funding from these people. You know, you get the lobbyists and the, with the government and they're to me they're manipulating the politicians to keep – with, with money, I mean, money talks, right? So they're using this money to keep the politicians in their pockets so the politicians pass these laws, and it's this giant institution that people keep running back to to save the world. Well, here's maybe a, a more concrete example. So take the Southern Baptists. You think about somebody who, who commits some sort of abuse and the, the higher-ups, uh, what, what is their propagandizing decision? Because there are lots of different ways that you can propagandize. One of the ways that we we discuss is when we you get to the news media, the news media, one of the biggest tools that they have is silence, right? You can be silent about certain issues. So Yemen is the big one that that you bring up a lot, right? If you don't hear about it, you don't you don't know it. And so even though that's not positive information, they're not telling you something, it's actually what they're not telling you that shapes your your understanding. So if you take the Southern Baptists, you know, they could say, well, there are lots of there are lots of Baptist issues that go on every day, every month. You know, we you know, we didn't tell you about this, not because you don't have access to that information. We would have told you if you asked, but you know, we just choose what things we're gonna highlight and we wanna highlight what's going on for the kingdom in Cambodia and what our missionaries are doing here. We just we didn't think that, that information was important to tell you. Right? And so if you you think about that, 
right? That's true. They, they selected that information and there's lots of information that they don't tell you. You just disagree with them about what information is important and what information is not. And they sincerely care about the kingdom of God and the advancement of the gospel. So they base their decisions of what to inform you about and not inform you about based on what they think is going to lead to those ends. That sounds like propaganda. Oh yeah. It's, it's just this, it's this really intricate web of self-justification and gaslighting and, um, you know, definition, definitional changes. And, and it's, it's very nebulous. Okay. You've probably already, um, actually you've already answered this. You said we all propagandize. You do it with your kids. You, you just said that because I was going to ask you, I said, do you see, is everything a propaganda? I was going to say as an anarchist, I see everything from politicians as propaganda, left versus right, don't recognize their own propaganda. But maybe they do recognize their own propaganda and they just don't care. Because there's there, the, 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 when the tribalism sets in, that's all that matters to them. Their tribe winning. That's, that seems to be the only thing that matters to them. They don't even care if their team is, is right about what they're saying. They just know that it's not the other team that they're that they're rooting. That that's that's who they're against. They don't even care if their team's wrong anymore. That's the, to me. That's what's gotten so bad with politics these days. They don't even care if they're. On. I was talking to a guy last night at work, and we were talking about Donald Trump. And he goes, "Man," and he goes, "I he goes, I would not hate if Donald Trump was my president for the rest for the rest of my life, forever." Well, I asked him. I said, "So you want a king?" You want you want a king for the rest of your life? Is 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 that what you're telling me? He goes, well, no, 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 not really. But and we got off topic from that because I, and so I started pointing out these these things because I try to talk to these folks where they're at. So I brought up the things that Donald Trump did in his violation of the United States Constitution. I mean, I could sit here and talk to him about anarchy, and he's gonna his eyes are gonna gloss over, and he's thinking I think I'm out there tearing down buildings. So I just met him where he's at. And I said, did you understand that Donald Trump was worse on the Second Amendment than even Barack Obama? I never heard Donald Trump say anything against guns. I said, really? So I listed off two things, two, two things. He goes, well, I didn't hear about that. I don't know nothing about it. I said, look it up. He said, Donald said, Donald Trump said, take the guns first, due process later. Second and Fourth Amendment, right there in one sentence that he that he was willing to violate. Okay, and when he banned bump stocks with an executive order, that was something Barack Obama said that I don't even have the authority to do. And, and I mentioned this to him, and he was blown away. He goes, "Well, I have to look that." I said, "Go look it up. It's easy to find." That's what I'm talking about. They don't even recognize. They don't even care that their team's saying these things. They gloss over it, but now if if Barack Obama or Joe Biden said those two very things or did those things, they'd be all over it, all over it. Yeah, and and that's uh you know one of the the biggest things that probably I come back to the most, like the biggest aspect of propaganda. Uh, Jacques Ellul in in his book Propaganda and uh, also the Technological Society, he talks a lot about how propaganda plays out and functions and and what it creates. And so he, you know, back, I think he wrote it around 1960, but he's, he talks about how propaganda produces extreme polarization. And he, he has some very prescient quotes in there where you're like, holy cow, this, like he wrote this 60 years ago. If you wouldn't have told me, I would have thought that he wrote this yesterday about current events, but he talks about propagandizing because what, what propaganda tends to do, uh, is it, it, it tries to, and this, this plays into kind of the topic of abuse, but it tends to isolate, right? Uh, it, it seeks to isolate individuals. It likes echo chambers um, and, and it produces lots of content, simple content, and then it wants to be reinforced. So play it as much as you can, make it as simple as you can so people can digest it. Um, and then uh, it, it creates this fear, this need, uh, this problem that needs to be resolved. And then who does it offer up as the savior, but itself, right? Abusers do the same thing. They'll, they'll, uh, treat the woman like crap. And it's not always a woman, right? But it's in, in all the conversations that I've had, it often is, um, statistically much more likely, but it's, uh, the abuser a lot of times will isolate, uh, and, and, uh, pull, pull somebody away from their friends, right? Pull the partner away from their friends. It will, 
uh, tell them that, oh, your friends hate you. They think that you're uh, petty. They think all these things. And, and then, right, you're all by yourself in this relationship with this other person. And who's the only person that you can get love from at that point? Well, that person, that person's going to love you and be wonderful to you a bunch of the time. And it's only when you step out of line that they're going to, to abuse you. And so they kind of create this, this community for you. And you get things like Stockholm Syndrome, syndrome that comes out of this. Right? How, do, how do hostages love their captors? It's, it's sort of how propaganda works, right? They're isolated. And then uh, how are they going to be freed? But the people who are in control of their lives are going to save them. And, and it creates this, this weird sort of, of bond that's kind of cyclical and just keeps getting reinforced. You just described my second marriage, but on the, in the reverse. <laughs> I think I told you a little bit that about that messaging, you know, setting this up. But I listened to that one episode. You had the two ladies on about uh, marital abuse and stuff, and and I, I I know it exists, and it's it's more prominent among you know men doing it to women, but it does happen in reverse, you know, sometimes. And I I was a part of one in my second marriage. It was. It was pretty rough and it was hard to get out of because she would tell me things that I, that I believed and which looking back now was complete nonsense. But I believed at the time that if I did this and you know, I, if, if it was just such, such a long story, it was such a mess that, and it's so many years ago that I don't even think about it anymore, but listening to that, that, that episode with those two ladies, which maybe you want to we'll talk about that a little bit more. So folks can go and look at it whenever they hear this, because it, it was a good conversation. I really, enjoyed what they had to say or appreciated what they had to say. I wouldn't say that I enjoyed it because it's, it's a tough, it's a tough topic, but I appreciated what they had to say. And I appreciate folks who will come out and, and talk about it out loud because a lot of folks are out there in these relationships and they don't know how to get out of them. And, you know, when it's something you hear in churches, like, and I've heard talk about, you know, you can't get a divorce. You can't leave your husband or your wife if they're abusive, because this is a God ordained marriage, but I guarantee you they got a state stamped marriage license in their drawer somewhere as well. So to me, that makes what, what that's a whole other topic. But anyway, let's talk about that a little bit, because, you know, just in case somebody listening may be in that situation, because I think people need to understand that you can walk away and it is not against God. If you're being abused in a relationship, verbally, mentally, physically, you can get out of it. You know, they always say that, well, you can only leave leave your, your man or wife or your husband or wife if uh, for fornication. Well, I think abuse is fornication. It's not just sexual. If you're being abused, get the hell out of it. And I know it sounds easier said than done. I mean, like I said, I was stuck in the mud in this in this marriage and didn't know how to get out. I knew I wanted out, but I didn't know how to get out. So what episode is that? Do you remember what episode number that is? So if they want to go back and listen to it, because this it was a it was a very, very uh interesting conversation that you had with these two ladies. Yeah, it's uh plans to be number nine in the season. So it's set uh, to release uh, February fifteenth. Okay. So folks, if you're listening to this and you might be in that situation or know somebody is, maybe go listen to this episode and listen to what these ladies had to say because it was I appreciate what they had to say, you know, and it was something I wish I'd have heard years ago, but it is what it is now. I got out of it. it took me longer than it should have. But <laughs> yeah, and I, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say because uh, it's something that I've read a lot. It's something that that uh, I believe it was Rosanna highlighted about her relationship. But uh, the the time when you break off with the individual, the time when you leave, when you separate is actually the most dangerous time. Uh, so even though it's a... It, it might be a very good and wise and the best decision to ultimately make. It's also something to, to take very seriously because it is the most dangerous time. Is that, did, did you find that, uh, if I can ask you, you, I guess you can edit this out too if you need to. Uh, so if, did you find that that things escalated when uh, she felt like she was losing control when, when you kind of severed things? Um, it was escalating towards the end and it, it led to the point where she had me, uh, she had me arrested on some trumped up charges, which none of them were true. And anybody knows me knew, knew they weren't true. And when I tell the story, like I'm not going to tell the story here on this show, but 
when I tell the story what happened, they, they everybody that knows me calls bullshit on it. They know. Okay, but it was my word against hers. And and fair, and, you know, in the South, a lot of the times, you know, the man is probably in the wrong here, but it was my word against hers with the cops, and they took her word, and I spent the night in jail. My mom came and picked me up uh, the next morning, and she was pissed off at me. And then when I explained to her exactly what happened, my mom my mom did not like this lady, did not like it. But she, she looked at me, and she goes, are you finally done with her? And I said, yeah, I think that'll do it. I think that I think that that was finally the last straw. You had me thrown in jail over some, you know, some bullshit. It was bullshit. I mean, and then if anybody wants to message me and talk to me about it, I'll tell them probably I'm not going to go into details here on the show about it, but it was, I'll tell them exactly what happens and they can go look it up themselves. But it was something that I had to cop to because I hired an attorney that was not very uh, competent and I just listened to everything he had to say and it just, that's years ago now, so it's all settled. I've got all that stuff cleared. It's all cleared off. So anyway, but yeah, I saw towards the end it was escalating. You know, there was one night I was standing in my uh, kitchen and had steak knives thrown at me, you know. So you talk about it being dangerous towards the end, you know, where if you do actually leave, it was pretty dangerous there in that situation too. So you got you to make a choice. And, and thankfully, when – I finally decided to leave. I left and went stayed with my mom until I got back on my feet and she left me alone. I thought then I ended up getting a roommate and then she moved in next door to me. It was really strange, man. And it just, it was really strange. And so now I don't even know where she's at now, Uh, nor do I care. Yeah. (laughs) I think, um, so, you know, talking about it, it being, dangerous towards the end you know i don't know exactly your relationship and uh obviously you know these are these are generalities it doesn't work the same with with everybody and there might be different tendencies when the abuser is a man too and since most are then it, it follows different patterns for a male abuser but a lot of times when when they start to lose control that's that's when things escalate uh because well i'll tell you what what i noticed when 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 you say they notice they're losing control. I noticed the manip- the manipulation side of it started to ramp up a lot more. You know, there was manipulation out throughout the marriage, right? A little bit here, a little bit there, and, and I guess it just you just get used to it and and, and whatever. But it, that really ramped up towards the end, you know, because I was threatening to leave. I'm like, I'm out of here. I'm not dealing with this anymore. And the manip- for some way, some reason, she was able to keep me there through manipulation. That's a whole another hour long discussion as well. But I I think what it what it highlights really well is, you know, why why is propaganda such a big deal? Um, there's a, a book uh, by David Graeber, who's I believe an anarchist, and he he has a book called The Dawn of Everything. And in there, he's not talking about propaganda, but he he talks about kind of how states function and and things. And he talks about how that there there are three basic ways that you can control things, right? So if if you're with somebody who needs control, or if you're with a state which is basically an abuser who needs control, you can use violence. The problem with violence is it's extremely risky. You know, animals in the wild, if they fight each other and one of them gets injured, uh, they're they're vulnerable, right? You don't if you use violence, you're taking a risk that you're going to get uh, hurt worse. Right. So there's there's an extreme cost to violence, but it's really effective. If you're stronger than somebody else, it's extremely effective because you just you have more violence, you have more power, and you can control the situation. Well, then there's there's information. And so the example that he uses is there's this uh, this lady. She's got like a really really valuable necklace, right? So she she wants to take really good care of it, and she doesn't want anybody to steal it. But everybody wants to steal it. Well, that's okay. She's got you know, big bodyguard or she knows jujitsu or something. And so she can handle herself. She's got violence. But what would actually be better for her is if you know, she she had information uh, because then she could avoid having confrontation. So nobody knows where she's going to be, at what events she's going to show up at. She just shows up. So people can't plan to rob her or she hides them in some safe somewhere or whatever. But she has information about about the situation that prevents violence. And then the last way 
to control things is is through charisma. So maybe she's just so loved by the community that nobody would dare to touch her. Or maybe she's just so charismatic that she's able to convince people not to steal from her, which is even better than information because that's just who you are, right? You're just charismatic. You don't need to manipulate any information. And so what what people tend to try to do is, right, you want to go to the lowest, lowest threshold possible. If I can convince you through my charisma, you know, if I've got stunning good looks and you can just fawn over me and uh, do whatever I want you to do, that's a whole lot easier than me trying to come up with some manipulative plan to control you and a whole lot safer than me trying to implement violence against you. But a lot of times charisma doesn't work or it wears off, right? Maybe she was your, your ex-wife wasn't manipulating you at first because she had enough charisma. Uh, maybe you were, your love for her initially just caused you to want to do things for her that were kind of unreasonable, but then her charisma wore off. And so then she starts to manipulate. And when the manipulation doesn't work anymore, now she goes to violence. And you see the same thing, exact same thing in states, right? Charisma, right? Mythology, all of this type of stuff. Uh, and then violence, if that doesn't work. Well, looking back, I have no idea. I have no idea what it was about her. I didn't know that she could cook and I like to eat. So <laughs> there was that. Maybe she was manipulating me with food or keeping me around with food. I don't know. But um, I don't know. Look, it, like that's shit, man. That's been 20 years ago, at least tw- probably 20 plus years now at this point. But I've pretty much re- remained single, you know, then, I mean, I've dated, but you know, since then that, since that marriage, I've been very cautious about who I date. And if I see something that, that I, I mean, I, I, I feel like my, my red flag radar is bigger than it's ever been. And maybe to a fault sometimes, and maybe I've pushed some people away when I shouldn't have, but it is what it is. It'll happen when it happens. But then it's, I've stayed single on, on purpose because of that second marriage. So I'm not lonely. I got friends. I can still, I can still hang out, whatever. But yeah, I don't, didn't really plan on any of that. <laughs> Derek on his show and talk about former marriages, but that's all good. It's all good. I don't mind talking about it. Yeah, it's, it's real. And it's, and I'm not, I don't, I don't shy away from it. it. It's just, it's just not something I've talked about in a long time. You know, I, I talked about it for a very long time, you know, years after, but like I said, 20 plus years later, I just, I rarely ever, ever think about it. And I hadn't thought about her since until I heard that episode that you did with those two ladies. And it reminded me of that second marriage. So I appreciate that conversation, you know, because maybe you got to keep that in the forefront when you're single out there and you're trying to, you, you know, you're wanting to date somebody. It's, it's okay to be cautious, I think, because you don't want to get into a situation. But it's, it's strange is, is, is why you can't see this stuff in the beginning, you know, how, how it happens over time. That's what, that's what's so strange to me is how it happens in small increments, but we weren't even married that long. So it was, it wasn't a, it was a short amount of time, but it, it was, but it seemed like it was just small things here and there that I can look back on. And towards the end, it got more and more and more and more and more. Cause maybe she did feel like I knew she was losing control. Cause I was finally, cause I had my mom in my ear. Like I said, my mom couldn't stand her. Yeah, and and that's a that's a really important aspect. So you know, you might have you might have just had uh, stronger relationships, or she might have been a bad manipulator, or some some combination of all of that. But a lot of times, what prop- uh, what uh, abusers will try to do is isolate you. No, oh, that happens one hundred percent, one hundred percent. I I couldn't hang out with my friends. I do remember that. I got in trouble. Not, I, when I say trouble, it was it always turned into a fight if I wanted to go hang out with my buddies. Why can't I go hang out with my buddies? I hung out with them before you came along. I'm not doing anything. We might go fishing. Yeah. That's all we're doing. We're just fishing. (laughs) We're not doing anything nefarious. We're not doing anything against you or anything. We're just hanging out. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a loss of, you know, there's a threat to control there, right? If, if she can't control your, your time and what you're doing, then that's a problem. And it's also a threat to control because of information. Like what if you go out and your, your buddies are like, Oh wow, she said that or she did that and then that that exposes, right? You can't have any of that uh, contradictory or dissonant information. Well, my buddies stopped coming around. Yeah. And if I did get a ch- chance to talk to them about it, they would look at me like, "What are you still doing there?" Because I felt like I had to be there. It was like I, I was obligated to be there, you know, and and full disclosure, she had three of her own kids and 
she liked to use those, you know, her kids against me as well. And they weren't, they weren't my kids, but I took them in. I took care of them, fed them, you know, clothed them and gave them shelter and stuff. So I, it's not like I was, but yeah, she would use that as a, as a ploy to, well, you can't kick us out because I have kids. I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, because I had a house when we got married and anyway, that's a whole, <laughs> there's a whole lot there. Okay. Let's, uh, I, I want to talk. I don't know how quickly you can talk about this, but there was something else, the conspiracy of corporatism. Talk to me a little bit about that. That's an interesting topic to me. Yeah. So, so the way that I have the season structured, because, you know, I, like I said, since 2016, I, I've been just trying to, to figure things out and it, it started on the road of not to nonviolence. Um, but that led to Christian anarchism because, you know, if you're not supposed to use the sword, then that creates a significant problem uh, in regard to wielding government. But then you know, kind of the last the last thing that I, I've been wanting to explore is how, how did everybody get on that ship, you know, that, that just crazy train? And so I wanted to look at truth, propaganda, conspiracies, kind of how all of those things, you know, how do we discern truth? How do we know what's true? So looking at propaganda and how how beliefs are formed, but then also as a part of each uh, series, I wanted to look at some true conspiracies and conspiracies that we know ended up being true, like pretty much without a doubt for the most part. And and then kind of evaluating, okay, well, what what happened? How was propaganda implemented? It seemed like a very big job to try to do. I think I have like seventy episodes scheduled for the season, so it's 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 big, and it could have been like ten times as big. But I was like, okay, you know, the I think the best place to start would be small. Like, let's look at how how do the most small scale propagandists function, which would be an abuse. And then we look at other things like propaganda with racism, propaganda in the media, propaganda in the in the medical community, government, military, like all all sorts of areas. But one of the areas, of course, that you want to look at with propaganda is is uh, corporations and businesses. And so, yeah, the, the uh, propaganda in regard to corporatism just kind of goes into how, how do businesses propagandize you and like what, what effect does that have? And, uh, you know, wh- what should you look out for and uh, what, what are some conspiracies that we've seen in regard to corporate propaganda? One thing I do appreciate about your show is the way you set these series up and the way you you tackle a a topic, you know, because with the Bad Roman podcast, we could be very random and I like it random, you know, but what I do appreciate about the fourth way is how you, you, you got a ton of information on your podcast, a ton of information. And I like how you break it down into series like that and you, and you, you flesh all this stuff out and you put it out there. So people can get into this one topic and listen to, like you said, you got what, 70 episodes. It could have been way more and just in this one series. Right. Right. Yeah. And I, and I appreciate, and man, that's gotta be a lot of work. I can't imagine, you know, you're married with kids and stuff and, and having, and taking the time to do that. I, I really appreciate the way you do that. And folks, if you've not heard um, the fourth way podcast, go check it out. You're going to learn something. And he's got a ton of pot. He's got a ton of episodes. You're going to find something in there that's going to suck you in and you're going to keep listening. And Derek, why don't you tell everybody where they can find you at, find your podcast at? Yeah. So I think, uh, I think it can be found pretty much anywhere that you can get, uh, get podcasts. And then, yeah, I I don't know where you, you don't find it. (laughs) Okay. Awesome. So like, and it's not the, the number four T H is spelt F O U R T H, right? Four correct. Four. Okay. Correct. All right. Just in case people are not familiar, I think a lot of folks, you know, I mean, you're in our discussion group, so you shared some stuff in there. So people are probably pretty familiar. And, I, and I've seen some other friends of mine, and I don't know if they're mutual friends of yours, but I've seen them share some of your stuff on their personal page as well. So I know people who, who listen to the bad Roman are familiar, but maybe not everybody. And I don't, I can't really pinpoint how big our audience is. I know it's it's growing, and I know it's grown since we started. So hopefully you're going to pick up some new listeners from this. And that was the whole point of doing this series of episodes that we're doing with this is to have other podcasters on so we can help promote their stuff. Because I realize with The Bad Roman how important that is to 
when folks would invite me onto their show that it's gained me some new listeners to the to the bad Roman. And I and that's what I want to do. I want to use this platform to help other platforms because I want everybody to have as much information as possible and they can figure this stuff out on their own. You know, it's like I said earlier, this is where Craig's landed on it. This is what Craig believes. And this is not Craig telling you how you should go about things. I used to be that way. I used to be very stubborn. Like, just do it this way and trust me, it's going to work out, (laughs) which is a very naive way of thinking. But so I've backed off of that and I'm like, this is where I'm at. You can take it or leave it. You got some questions. I'll be, I'll do my best to answer them, but that's what I want to do with this series is get enough information and other enough information about other podcasts out there. So people, cause that people, man, if you look at corporate media, that stuff's going away. People are, are running from that stuff and they're, they're looking at podcasts, you know, and there's a bunch of podcasts. I heard something the other day, there's over 2 million podcasts. Maybe there, there may be more than that. You know, that's a lot of podcasts, but how many people are on this planet? Six, seven billion people. We need more podcasts. We need a billion podcasts. I mean, even even if it just just having more podcasts shows that there are more people working through information and thinking, hopefully. Um, and so, I, yeah, I agree with you. More podcasts. Let's do this again. We'll, we'll figure something else to talk about. I think people are going to really enjoy this conversation. We talked about. I mean, we talked about some stuff I had not planned on talking about, you know, with the Southern Baptist stuff and then my second marriage and <laughs> all this stuff. So that's okay. That's what we do with this show. We just kind of bounce around and see where we end up. And I think people appreciate that, that they, they get to hear. They're just eavesdropping in on a conversation between me and Derek. And that's what I like about this. I, I appreciate you being real and, and uh, vulnerable. Yeah, I've gotten pretty good at that, I think. Not to pat myself on the back, but <laughs> it seems like it's been it's it's easier to be vulnerable and just put it out there instead of you know I'm I'm a private person to a point, but I'm also a social butterfly by nature, so it's not it's not hard for me to put stuff out there because I don't I don't I'm, I don't have anything to hide. I'm not I'm not a perfect person by any means. So, but I'm going to tell you you know how I feel. Yeah. All right, buddy. I'm going to let you get out of here and folks go listen to the fourth way and. Uh, Derek, I will talk to you soon. All right. Thanks so much for having me on. Yes, sir. Thanks for joining us this week on the Bad Roman Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcasts to never miss an episode. And while you're at it, if you like what you heard, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, it really helps people find us. 100% of donations are given to local charities in Memphis, Tennessee. To learn more about The Bad Roman Project and to find show notes, please visit thebadroman.com.